Hello, this is Joy News Desk with me, Sweetie Abochi. Welcome to the program. In our top stories, um, Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia and other stakeholders ask Ghanaians to work towards ensuring peace during the electioneering year. The campaign season for the elections in December, let us all be guided by acts which will preserve and uphold the diversity of our country and its unity. Former member of the Parliament for Ejiso to go independent would we'll hear from his camp on the show. We've got business as well and details following shortly. My name is Sweetie Aboshi. Do stay with me. Now let's get into the details. Former member of parliament for Ejisu, Kwabno Wusu Ediomi, says he will contest the vacant Ejisu seat as an independent candidate. The declaration comes a day ahead of the New Patriotic Party's primary to elect a candidate for the upcoming by-election. A press release from the camp of the former MP ascribes a decision to severe ties with the party to what they claim to be the reluctance of the party to deal with crucial concerns with a voter album. It further points out that there are flaws in the election process for polling station executives, claiming the deceased MP, with the help of the regional executives, handpicked some persons for key positions. Campaign aide of the former MP, Nana Osei Bonsu, joins us now on phone. Nana Osei Bonsu, thanks for joining us. Could you clarify what these issues are that cause you to sever ties with the NPP? Your boss, I mean. Me. Uh, if viewers and listeners would recall, uh, the polling station executive in elections uh, in Ejusho was not done in accordance with what the general practice has been. Uh, we woke up one early morning uh, to the news that people had been selected to fill uh, Police station executive position. Uh, we protested, but the party would simply not hear or give us give us hearing. And so the matter eventually found its way into court. And as we speak, the issue is still pending. And so it is surprising that uh, uh, the party has not made any effort uh, to for, for even reconciling, at, at even reconciling the uh, what do you call it. Uh, uh, aggrieved, aggrieved members of it, but then proceeding to to conduct primaries when they know that there are pertinent issues to be addressed. So, as a former member of parliament, how confident are you that going as an independent candidate, you could secure this victory? Uh, well, uh, this decision is even in response to calls by constituents. If you conduct, if you, if you even come here and conduct an opinion poll, we find out that almost everybody is calling for a comeback. And so it is a response, it is in response to that call. So we are, we are more than confident. We, are, we have an exuding confidence that we, 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 we win this election. So as it stands, there's no relationship at all with the New Patriotic Party? Uh, exactly, exactly. He's contesting on an independent ticket. Okay, so um, how are you proceeding after the primaries or are you started campaigning already as an independent candidate, I mean? Uh, well, uh, the schedule for election has been released. And uh, now the process, the process is on, uh, still, still, still ongoing. Uh, I think forms, uh, uh, nomination forms will be filed uh, from next week, I think from 16th or so, I'm not too sure. With a, with a, but for now... Uh, we, 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 we are doing the paperwork. We hit the ground running very soon. But what does he hope to do differently? I mean, he was a member of parliament for that constituency. What do you want to do differently now? Uh, well, uh, yeah. under, 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 his, uh, under his leadership during his tenure, I just witnessed uh, massive infrastructural development. 
uh, on on a scale that I am not too sure there's any constituency in in, in Ashanti region uh, that can match up to. And so uh, the people have seen for themselves, and they felt his absence when he was not there. And this is why they are calling for his comeback. They want the continuation of what he had started already. Thank you so much. Um, that's the aid for the Nana Osaibonsu, the aid for the former MP, Kwabuna Edionim. But let's go to Nana Yao, Nana Yao Jima in the Ashanti region to give us the mood of what's happening. Nana, if you can hear me, how are people preparing in it for the uh, primaries? So the little investigation that I have been doing at so far indicates that all the aspirants are wrapping up their campaigns. They are visiting the delegates for the last time before tomorrow's election. Um, if you go to Edgeso, you get the sense of of of, of the by the uh, primary, which is being held tomorrow. Various aspirants have their um, their posters all over the Edgeso constituency, especially where the election will be held within the constituency. People are now starting to uh, make posters to indicate tomorrow's election. Now, the delegates are very become cool. The few that I've spoken to tell me they've made up their minds, but some of them, most of them, will not be the candidates that they are voting for. But so far, um, these candidates are also trying to wrap up their campaigns, trying to speak to these delegates for the last time to, to ensure that they are able to win the election come tomorrow. I've been speaking to party leadership within the Joshua constituency. The constituency chairman tells me he's ready, his people are ready, all is set for the election, which is scheduled for tomorrow. Well, Nana Osebuns was just saying that um, his boss, the, the former MP Kwame Dunu, was um, called. He got calls from the constituents to contest again. Is there any indication that this is, um, this is in fact, the reality on ground? I cannot confirm if indeed um, he was called by the, some people to contest the election. But the information I had was that some leaders or some people within the party were expectant of him coming to the uh, party office to pick a funds for the primary. So um, at a point in time, you hear people speculating that it's very possible that Mr. Adiomi will pick um, a form for the election. But unfortunately, we did not see him there. And that has fueled his um, ambition to run as an independent candidate. But as to whether he was called upon or his chances in winning the election itself, I cannot give any further details on that. But what I know is that um, there were some people within the party office who were, who, who were expecting him to come in, walk in, and pick a form to contest the election. But unfortunately, he never showed up within the party offices when the forms were, the, when nominations were opened for people or interested parties to pick forms for the election. Are there any reactions from the people of Ejisu on the back of the severance of relationship between... Um, um, any reactions from the... Constituents, Ejisu, about the severance of their relationship? The, um, so the I believe you are and... asking about the constituent, the, the, the constituent itself. Come again. So, so I, I believe you are asking about the reaction from constituents. You know, a lot of these constituents are expectant of the NPP's choice for the by-election. Mind you, Ejoso is an area that the NPP has been has been winning massively when exactly. it comes to right. parliamentary elections and also mm -hmm. the uh, presidential elections. And people are expectant of the choice. They believe that. If the NPP is able to make a very good choice, very good candidate, it's likely that the people of Ejusu will accept the choice that will be made by the delegates come Saturday. Okay, but what I was seeking clarity on is whether the news of um, Mr. Diomi's severance of relationship with the NPP was received well, or how, how was the news received by the people? It's, it's still fresh. Um, not many people 
have gotten wind of this information. Okay. But the few that I've noticed or I've seen within the constituency, within the constituency are surprised that Mr. Ediomi would decide to go independent. But they believe that if um, that there is need for an independent candidate, it will only uh, be emphasized on 30th of this month when they go to the polls in the by-election. But they believe that Mr. Ediomi is one of the people who serve the constituency very well. But he has to do he will have to do more if he would want to stage a comeback, especially as an independent candidate. Right. Thank you so much, Nana Yaojima, who is giving us more insights onto this um, developing story on the AGSO primary slated for 30th of April. But moving on, Vice President and flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, is admonishing the youth not to allow themselves to be used as conduits for electoral violence. Ghana's general elections over the years have seen pockets of violence, usually perpetrated by the youth. The New Patriotic Party's flag bearer wants Ghanaians to uphold peace and tolerance for each other, to foster unity in the diverse political landscape. <laughs> Speaking at Thursday's Eid prayers in the Shanti region, the vice president emphasized on the need to embrace an election free of violence. As we approach the campaign season for the elections in December, let us all be guided by acts which will preserve and uphold the diversity of our country and its unity. To the youth, you are the nation's most valuable asset. And no circumstance, under no circumstance, should anybody lead you into form of electoral, into any form of electoral violence. Ghana needs you, safe, active, and lively, to lead the nation's charge in the promising fourth industrial revolution. Let us all say no to all forms of electoral violence. Ashanti Regional Chief Imam Sheikh Abdul Mumin Harun urged the Muslim community to evoke a sense of nationalism as emphasized in the Holy Quran. Prophet Muhammad emphasized his love for Mecca, but his people rejected him. Love your country, avoid violence. Thirty days of fasting and remaining pious before God, the Muslim community in the Ashanti region climaxed the holy month of Ramadan with prayers and merrymaking. Muslims express gratitude to Allah for the strength and guidance received during the fast, fostering a sense of compassion and giving. Some members of the fraternity were grateful for the new year as they admonished a continuous holy living even after the fast. Month for which everyone comports themselves. However, now it has gone. We are happy at the same time. We are sad because now every human being or every individual can have the right to do whatever. But I'm praying that we have to still maintain the tenets of the whole month of Ramadan so that we don't go back to our previous um, predicaments. So uh, I would like to wish everyone, Barakat Asala, especially Bright, Bright of uh, Joy News and everybody there. For Joy News, my name is Amanmo, Bright Quickly. Away from that, outgoing Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz bin Sali has appealed to the leadership of the various Muslim sects in the country to eschew all forms of fundamentalism and extremism in order not to allow agents of destruction to infiltrate their ranks. Rafiq Salam has the rest of the story. Followers of the Orthodox Muslim faith and the al Sunnah Jamaat in the one municipality ended the 29th day Ramadan fasting on Tuesday, following the sighting of the moon in some few communities in the country, including Bulinge, 
in the Wais district. Tens of thousands of Orthodox Muslims in the one municipality throng in droves to the various venues where the two rakat open congregational prayer is to be performed. The Nasiri Bomi II Park had the largest gathering, both the young and old, majority of whom gorgeously dressed in white apparel, were there in their numbers. The overlord of the Wala Traditional Area, now for the city Pilipot IV, accompanied by litany of sub and divisional chiefs, were present, adding color, culture, tradition, and splendor to the occasion. Jami Imam Alaji Yaya Punjang led arguably the largest Muslim sect in the region for the prayers. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This year's Eid of Fitri is held on the team Peace before, during, and after the 2024 general election. Administrative officer to the Upper West Regional Chief Imam Alaji Yaya Dauda urged members of the Muslim Muma to see the election beyond partisan politics and also refrain from acts that will bring violence in the country. Perceiving the crucial nature of the upcoming general elections, it is a must win contest, especially for the two major parties. We, Muslim Ummah, now reiterate and call, we give a clear call to every Muslim, because this is a collective responsibility of every Muslim Ummah. We should therefore see the election and place it above partisan politics. It is but a period of transition. Whoever other chooses for us will cooperate and forge ahead courageously. Al Haji Yaya Dauda also used the opportunity to call on the Electoral Commission, secret agencies, and the media to discharge their duties in an unpartisan, fair, and unbiased way so as to prevent dispute that may plunge the country into chaos. All eyes are looking up to some people. One, electoral commission is easy. Two, the media. Three, the security agencies. We therefore pray that this will to execute their electionary mandate. Objectively, this will be very, very prudent so that at the end of it all, the outcome of the 2024 general election will be universally accepted and there will be peace in Ghana and will continue to enjoy the peace. The Upper West Regional Chief Imam's Administrative Officer, however, was not oblivious of the punishing high temperatures that they were subjected to during the one-month fasting period in the region. According to the Meteorological Agency, temperatures in the region rose as high to 45 degrees Celsius. We see the appearance of the heat of the sun as a blessing because we will ask to believe that nothing good comes easy. And because Almighty Allah wants to accept the Ramadan, that he wants to trial and suffer for it, at the end of it all, Almighty Allah will shower us with abundant blessings. So Alhamdulillah, we now only pray that Almighty Allah so what I down a little so that we can continue worship it. So it is a blessing. Members of the Al Sunnah Wajamat also observed the yearly Eid prayers at the West Senior High Technical School football field. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam. Wa. Now, still on the just ended Eid celebrations, let's now go to the central region where the regional minister, Justina Marigunasan, is appealing to Muslims across the country not to allow themselves to be used by politicians to foment trouble in this electioneering year. Speaking at this year's Eid celebration, the minister entreated the celebrants to unite and live in harmony with their neighbors. There's more in this report. Followers of the Orthodox Muslim faith. The Muslim faithful in Cape Coast assembled at various prayer grounds to offer prayers to Allah for guiding and protecting them throughout their 30-day prayers and fasting. Addressing the celebrant, Central Regional Minister Justina Marigorasan called on the Muslims to help sustain the peace the country enjoys. She particularly warned the Muslim youth to guard against anything 
that will make them agents of violence. Where there is violence, there is no development. Where violence thrives, marriage cannot even thrive. And where there is no peace, politics cannot also thrive. This is an election year. We must do everything to protect the sanctity and the peace we have in the country. We should not see each other as enemies. You should not allow any politician to use you for their selfish gains. I know the security personnel are up to the task to help in providing security. The vice president has indicated to me that it wouldn't be long he will come and engage you himself. Oh yeah, His Excellency, Alaji, Mahmoudou, Baumia. The head of the regional Zongo chiefs, Chief Mahmoud Dandi Mazawaje, called for peace in this year's election. The good rule message is that we maintain peace, especially during this election year. With regard to the people of Cape Coast, of that matter, Santa region, we are known for conducting peaceful elections. And I just spoke to my people that we should maintain that prestige. We are always known for peaceful elections. And in this case, even the whole Ghana, we have to make sure that we maintain peace. It's a matter of respecting each other's view. As simple as that. We respect each other. Even if I have a message for the government with regard to the economy, I think we put people in place. We give them that mandate to work it out for us in order that our economy will be good. We are, we are looking forward to them. The Muslim prayers were said and Allah's blessings and protections were sought by the celebrants. Let's stay in the central region for a bit longer where former Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Professor Francisca Dora Edubwando, has questioned the use of unparliamentary language in Ghana's parliament. According to her, the language used in parliament leaves much to be desired and something must be done to protect the sanctity of Ghana's parliament's discourse. Speaking at her inaugural lecture at the University of Cape Coast, Professor Edubwando also indicated that Ghana is heading towards ethno-linguistics identity crisis. There's more in this report. Professor Dora Francesca Edubwando's inaugural lecture first put a spotlight on parliamentary discourse. Here are the findings of her research. The findings included that the use of unparliamentary language border on impoliteness because the language used questioned the integrity and credibility of MPs affected. It imputed intellectual weakness in their person and we also found untruth, deception and criminality in their personalities. Karl Papa, Holmes, Mara and Schnorr say that when you behave like this, you are being impolite. Our parliamentary discourses of our times have obscenities, provocative or threatening language, personal attacks and insults. And we can describe them as being offensive, abusive, and insulting. And sometimes it even clouds the discussion on the table, discussion on the floor, because people get angry, they insult, and others get angry, and the issue for discussion is lost. Our parliament has become such that the unparliamentary discourse in the discourse of our times have gone so bad that the speaker himself had to use unparliamentary language to caution the use of unparliamentary discourse <laughs> by referring to the parliamentarians as if they are in uh, the market or choba. That is unparliamentary discourse in itself. But the speaker had to use unparliamentary discourse to caution unparliamentary discourse. 
Doctor, if you know the norms of language use, you will not engage in discourse that will demand that you come back later to say, oh, it was just a joke. If it's a joke, we should all say that it's a joke. Or to say that, oh, I didn't mean to say that. It is just what you meant. So when somebody, next time when somebody tells you that, oh, I don't mean to insult you, that's exactly what the person wanted to do. Prof Chair, the norms of respect, courtesy, and others I wouldn't have time to cover in this lecture are crucial for proficient engagement in discourse and also for our collective national identity. Because our personal and collective national identities are linked to the way we use language. Professor Edubuando senses the country may be heading towards ethno-linguistic crisis. I have worked in ethno-linguistic identity for some time because that was what my PhD work uh, focused on. Ethno-linguistic identity is about how we use language to present who we are. In a paper I did with Owe, we, we realized that Ghanaians have negative perceptions, attitudes to our own languages. Recently, I heard that uh, in parliament, they're going to use Ghanaian languages, but I didn't hear the modality for it. So I guess it's just like other things we say. And it looks like we are heading towards an ethno-linguistic identity crisis. Because most of our youth in the younger generations do not speak any Ghanaian language. When I did my study, I met people who are students of this university and they didn't speak even one. Ghanian the Vice Chancellor of the University the of Cape Coast, Professor Johnson Yako Buampong, supported the College of Professors to robe the now full Professor Dora Francisca Edubuando into the College of Professors. In other news, a 28-year-old Bogatanga biker who is now on a cycling expedition to Accra says three key factors inspired him to embark on the journey. James Kubeni advocates for green mobility, particularly the usage of bicycles, which have no detrimental influence on the environment. He says engaging individuals on his trip to Kumasi and their reactions provide a picture of how uninformed people are about climate change, hence the need to educate and sensitize Ghanaians about the phenomenon's impact. Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin spoke with James after the crew arrived in Kumasi. Three days, James has already covered over 540 kilometers from Bolga to Kumasi. Today, Thursday, he would begin the remaining journey from Kumasi to Accra, which is about 250 kilometers. Considering the distance covered by James so far, you should be seeing him in Accra latest by Friday. But let's engage James about the challenges, great moments, and the lovely people he met on his way to Kumasi. We would also talk about environmental sustainability. What inspired you to embark on this challenging journey of riding? bicycle from Bolga to Accra. We use your bicycle, your bicycle doesn't really produce any carbon emissions. So I said no problem. Let me actually use my bicycle to actually uh, promote it as an alternative means of transport. So if I promote it as an alternative means of transport, we are shifting towards green transportation. And if we actually move to green transportation, what it means is that we are actually going to reduce carbon emissions in the atmosphere mm. and in the long term we are also trying to control climate change which is now a very big problem mm. so with all this i said uh, i need to do something i have to protect the environment it's very important so this is the major thing that actually sets me off to this to this uh, journey but aside that uh, there's someone called jo uh, joel atinga Joel Atinga is actually embarking on a Guinness World Record attempt in Accra. Yes, he's very young like I am here. So the thing is, how can I also support other people? How can you support the young ones who are growing? As young as I am, if I need support, I would want people to. So if he also needs support, we would have to support him in whichever way. So I also said, let me use this, my trip to also uh, throw my support for him, that is to encourage him to also do well. If he does well, he puts the whole of Ghana on the map. 
for us you know if you promote kebab that's what we have here in fact we are going to boost tourism so all this we are putting gun on the map so with this my trip i decided to throw support for him mm. aside that too since i am actually promoting bicycles as alternative means of transport that is um, looking at green transportation to reduce carbon emissions and and um, reduce or uh, to actually handle or tackle the climate change issue i also talked about uh, safety for cyclists yes we actually share the road yes and also one thing is that the roads are not really friendly to cyclists mm. yes it's like they were not we cyclists were not really considered when they were constructing these roads so with this my trip i'm also trying to send a message across that cyclists need to be protected we need to be safe we shouldn't be knocked down just because we are using bicycles and the roads too shouldn't be just be constructed for just some other road users when they are constructing the whatever they are doing they also consider cycling so let's look at the challenges that you faced along the way and how did you overcome them vehicular smokes it was a big challenge for me when they are passing by the smoke alone would want you to either stop somewhere else or to pedal faster and pass them which is actually in fact this particular challenge gave me motivation to even pedal harder because it's one of the things i'm trying to reduce yeah so one thing is the smoke from vehicles were really not good at all for me very important and also one thing is drivers really were not really paying attention to cyclists you see you're on the road that's just at the edges and you see a driver just drive by you so if uh, the car mistakenly touches you, you are off, you know, you are knocked down somewhere. So one challenge is how other road users were not really friendly to me on the road. Yes. How did I overcome this? So when I see a vehicle coming, I just move, I get off the road. Yes, I just get off the road a bit and they pass and then I take the main road. I actually came with a road bike. It's not a mountain bike or a gravel bike those bikes are just meant for the third road so if you are just off the road that's in the sun you can actually fall so whatever it is i would still have to get back to the main road to ride when you were coming did you notice any difference in the challenges faced by people along the communities that you pass through i saw some women and children actually carrying water along the roadside they were actually in a queue they were moving like in a queue form so one thing that came to my mind was they don't really have drinking water so they have to go somewhere else to fetch the water so it's one actually one challenge i also one um, community problem i actually observed when i was moving advice would you give to others considering embarking on a similar journey or seeking to push this your own physical and mental limits yeah there are a whole lot of issues that we can all solve and with the bicycle i know we can use it to make a whole lot of changes in society yeah so for anyone who wants to embark on an, on an adventure like this i would actually advise a person to do it and do it very well yes there's no need saying the distance is far as long as whatever you are going to do is going to benefit people and benefit community you may suffer a little bit on the road but it's not going to be forever i'm doing five days on the road after five days i'm done riding yes so anyone who wants to actually embark on a trip like this i would advise the person to actually take a problem like i have done and also see how the person can use his cycling to actually solve the problem because what i believe is that cycling can solve a whole lot of issues mm. it's not just riding um, to benefit you yourself alone but when you ride to you benefit others there are times that you ride and people are interested and you introduce them to it and also get the benefit so you see that it's not just directly on you yourself but the society if uh, we are able to reduce these, these uh, carbon emissions which I know it will 
what will happen is a whole general benefit for everybody mm. so anyone who wants to actually embark on something like this i would advise a person to pick one issue in the community in the society and actually go hard on it because the issues are many and one person cannot solve all we must all come on board so anyone anywhere who wants to actually embark on a cycling trip to promote something like this or something different i would actually advise the person to do it and do it very well because mm. we need it now okay so looking back on uh, on your journey from bolga what lessons or insights have you gained about yourself ghana and the human spirit capacity for resilience and adventure so one thing i've learned is that people don't know people don't know i think uh, information still needs to be sent out to everybody because sometimes we talk about when i meet others and then i'm telling them what i'm doing and the benefits it will bring they think like once i'm riding i'm getting it on just on me alone you know so one thing is that as i always uh, tell them they will get to understand that okay so if we get to ride bikes we're going to actually reduce carbon emissions and when we do that we get fresh and cleaner air to breathe so one thing is that uh, the information is not out there yet which we must all try you know various ways to actually send out the information of course one other thing too i've come to learn is it will always not be easy hmm. i've not really done this before this is the first time i'm going 815 kilometers back to back every morning every morning i have to ride if i don't even ride at least 170 kilometers i should do so one thing i've also come to learn is that you wouldn't find things easy but if there's something you want to achieve i know very well that you have to do everything possible which is what i'm doing right now mm. trying to make sure that i finish the journey and let the people know that we can actually take care of the environment we can actually get fresh air to breathe you know when we adopt bicycle as alternative means of transport mm. you know we are now talking about green transports we want to shift to one side because there's one way that we can use to actually save our environment like i mentioned climate change is one big issue that we are talking about let me say that when it comes to matters of the environment I don't think it should be left onto just a few individuals to handle. It's, it's, it should be a major problem for everybody because, like I said, it is the only thing we have is the environment. And if we destroy it, we are destroying our own selves. So before I go, I would want to say that everyone should join this. Everyone should join this. It's very important. Whichever way you can do to save the environment, I've chosen to actually talk about clean air that is to reduce carbon emissions there are so many ways that we can actually uh, uh, promote a good environment so anyone who is watching this i would want to say once it's the environment you should get involved because if we destroy it and you are unconcerned it will surely come to you because we are all in it together Well, big congratulations there to James Kumbeni for that environmental friend, uh, awareness creation. But in other stories, the Ghana Revenue Authority is educating clients on its online portal for tax payment. The exercise is being used to sensitize individuals, employees and companies on the need to promptly file their monthly tax returns for accountability. Chief Revenue Officer at Cape Coast South Office of the GRA, Kenneth Victor Kofi Tobi says the appreciation of people in the payment of taxes is low, hence the need to embark on this education. Paying is about the uh, tax and then good governance. The aim is to educate the taxpayers about their obligations. And uh, normally what we do is that uh, we go around or we invite them and then educate them on uh, filing. For example, at the end of the year, and by the close of April, you need to file your returns. If you are not able to file, or if you don't file your returns, the system generates penalty. And the penalty is the day, the end of December, if you don't file your returns, 
that day is 500. And each day that the return is not far is 10 cities. So we are advising the public, both individuals and companies, to file their returns. Because if you apply for tax clearance certificate and you have not filed the returns, the system will not accept you. And if you, you, you go ahead to file to the system, the system will generate penalty. And because of that, a lot of taxpayers are having problems. So what we are trying to do is to go around and educate them to file their returns. For example, we have uh, the individuals. The individuals, your year of assessment is, we call it the calendar year, from 1st or January to December 31st. You have to file it. Employees, they have to file it. So I am announcing to the, all the employees, I mean, wherever you are, please file your returns. Otherwise, when you need something like tax clearance certificate, it will be difficult for you. You have to pay a penalty before the system clears you. Then companies too. There are some companies also, their uh, a, a year of assessment is January to December. But there are some to their year of assessment, we call it accounting year, from maybe June to July. So when it ends at June, count four months and file. So that is the company. Normally this thing is the, is the multinationals that have their accounting year or their year of assessment different from the calendar year. Because they are multinationals, they have, uh, uh, they normally prepare group accounts. So they always want their year of assessment to correspond with their uh, uh, parent companies. So that is what we are trying to do now, to file, everybody should file his returns. Otherwise, when you go or you apply, even online, the system will reject you. You have to file it. That's the purpose of uh, this. Filing of returns in Cape Coast South, uh, as of now, our, our rate of filing is around between 75 to 80%. Let's take a break now. There's business news when we return. Stay. Hello, good morning and welcome to business here on the Joy News Desk with me, Pius Kojo Baka. The Tree Crops Development Authority has received $100 million from the World Bank, addressing the media at the launch of the Sith International Council of Ministers Conference of Kashiu. Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Authority, Yao Oteng, disclosed that about 60% of the loan will be used to fund the cashew industry to boost production. From the export of cashew in 2023 was 400 million dollars, according to Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Tree Crops Development Authority, Yao Oteng. Ghana exports 300,000 metric tons of cashew, yet the country processes only 30,000 metric tons. But the authority has received funding from the World Bank to expand the subsector. Most of the Ghana cashew exports go to Vietnam and India. And recently, uh, I was in Germany, I saw a, a, a cashew residual product. I actually thought it was chocolate, but then it was made from cashew. And the European Union is buying deeply into cashew. And that is, uh, I'm sure that is why uh, the World Bank has is giving us almost uh, USD 100 million, out of which 60% is going to be used for cashew development. What, what the World Bank has done under uh, one of the components is to give matching grants to processors. We need to upscale the production of cashew. Speaking at a press launch of the Sith International Council of Ministers Conference of Cashew, Mr. Oting says his outfit has instituted initiatives to mitigate the impact of climate change on tree crops as well as tap into the carbon market. You know, measurement of carbon per acre, carbon sequestration per acre, of any quantum of trees, depending on the tree height and all of that. So this model is being perfected, which we will share with the European community and all green 
you know, uh, green, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, green organizations focused on carbon sequestration for repatriation of, you know, for proper effective measurement of carbon sequestration and then conversion of same to foreign exchange for the government of Ghana. The Sith International Council of Ministers Conference of Kashu, alongside the Kashu Research Dialogue, Kashu Fair and Exhibition, will be held from 16th to 20th April 2024. Yawating tells the impact it would have on the economy. By hosting these events, Ghana stands to gain, gain significantly. We have the opportunity to showcase our progress and potential in the Kashu sector, attract more foreign direct investments, Further development, they develop the industry, increase the processing capacity of, and of course, much needed foreign exchange to stabilize our city. Moreover, the awareness and the visibility created during these events will lead to increased production, like I said, development, increased processing, increased exports, consumption of raw cashew products, which will benefit fit both producers, consumers, and all actors within the cashew value chain. The conference is themed projecting the cashew sector through local consumption, value addition, and job creation. Chief Executive of the Ghana Enterprises Agency, Kosi Yanki Aye, believes its partnership with Ghana Post will help enhance the competitiveness of Ghanaian businesses. The Ghana Enterprises Agency and the Ghana Post have entered into a mutual agreement to support micro, small and medium enterprises with market access for their goods and services. The collaboration forms part of the Ghana Enterprise Agency's initiative to support these small businesses to enter major markets globally. Through the strategic partnership, we can harness our synergies um, to create new opportunities to expand access to markets and enhance the competitiveness of Ghanaian businesses. And why is access to markets very important for us in this new project? It's really so important because we realize that over the years people produce things and really finding markets is quite difficult. We've also realized the importance of the e-commerce platform and tools. So you have people who are on various e-commerce portals and how to get their products from one point to another is really a question that is coming up. And we believe that once we build the strong partnership together, we can work on both fronts. In with the new things, which is e-commerce delivery service. And the second is also really looking at utilizing your facilities to create the access to markets for the beneficiaries of our program. So thank you very much for coming. And that's it for business. I am Pius Kujubaka. Sweetie, back to wrap up. Welcome back. But that's how we're wrapping up for Joy News Desk for today, Friday. Do have a good weekend. My name is Sweetie Abochi. Um, thank you for watching.